Welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this live program. It's always a pleasure to join you. Uh, this is Open Line First Monday, when I have uh, the privilege of inviting back a, a guest who's been who's already shared his journey, but now he's here to even uh, take on more of your questions. And it's open line, so whatever question you want to pose to my guest tonight is, is open, within reason, of course. Uh, but you're an important part of this program, so let me give you the phone number right off the bat. It's 1-800-221-9460, or you can send us an email at journeyhome at ewtn.com. Now, my guest tonight is Steve Ray. This is the third time you've joined us on The Journey Home. He was here way back uh, when you shared your journey, but also you at that time only had one book out, which yeah. was um, Crossing the Tiber, right. which told your story. So uh, I encourage the audience. You're only get, going to get a snippet of Steve's journey into the church tonight. But if you'd like to hear the whole story, you can get his book, Crossing the Tiber. Uh, and then since then, he's had two other books. Uh, and he's been involved very... <laughs> What's the word? I mean, you were uh, up to your knees in uh, sand and in water land. in uh, the yeah. Holy Land. He's just returned from six weeks in Egypt and the Holy Land filming for uh, parts of his new 10-part series on the history of salvation, which we can talk about in a little bit. And uh, some of those ideas will help uh, seed the, the pot for our discussion tonight. But remember, you're an important part, so we have to start calling now. If you would, with your questions at 1-800-221-9460. Steve, welcome back to The Journey Home. It's good to be here. It's, it's I love to watch fun. it every, every week, and it's fun to be here. Though, too. I remember the first time you were on, I mean, by the time we got close to the end of the program, you were almost standing preaching at the audience. <laughs> and again, it was a shame that it was only an hour program. So yeah. it's good to have you back. Well, thank you. And uh, especially, you've just arrived. You're a little bit of jet lag still? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm still, it's about... Uh, 12 o'clock midnight for me right now. <laughs> well, good to have you back. <laughs> Thank you. Let's, how about a quick five-minute summary of your journey into the faith to re remind the audience of, of okay. why you became Catholic? I never get tired of telling the story. <laughs> I never get tired. And in fact, my wife and I, we've been Catholics for eight years now, and I have to tell you, I still feel like a new convert. Mm -hmm. I, the excitement of it hasn't worn off. I hope it never does. Yeah. I, I have to blame my conversion on my parents uh, in the long run because they taught me from the very beginning to love Jesus and to love the Bible. And a friend of mine who later on was a, a good, um, in fact, I led him to the Lord. Uh, and then he became a Catholic subsequent to that. And he told me, if you really love Jesus and the Bible enough and you really take them seriously, eventually you'll become a Catholic. And I told him he was crazy. But I have to blame it on my mom and dad because they taught me from the very beginning there was nothing more important in life than loving Jesus and loving the Bible. And as I grew up, I loved both of them. And it was my real passion in life. It was, it was uh, eternal life and to know Jesus, who the Son of God and my Savior. And the way we are taught to know that is the Bible. And so the Bible became a passion for me as well, to study it and to love it. And over time, I accepted the Bible from my Baptist tradition. And I didn't challenge that. I just read it with those uh, lens of the Baptist tradition. And I understood the Bible in terms of that tradition. But as I grew up and I talked to other evangelicals, maybe from a Presbyterian position or Methodist position that were also evangelical Protestants, I found that there were some big differences in the way that the Bible was interpreted. And so I started buying commentaries and Bible study books so that I could understand what the Bible meant and some of these key issues where there was controversies. I wanted to know what the truth was. And I ended up with over a hundred commentaries on the Gospel of John, a hundred commentaries on the Gospel of Matthew. One whole wall of my house is commentaries on Scripture because I loved the Bible so much I wanted to know what it meant. And yet, the more commentaries I got and the more I studied the Bible, the more I realized that there was a great divergence, disparity in what people taught. Were, were you supposed to baptize infants or not? My tradition, a Baptist tradition, said absolutely not. And yet there were other evangelicals that said absolutely you should baptize infants. Another one, can you lose your salvation? Good Baptist preacher said yes, good Baptist preacher said no. So I had to study the Bible and find these things out. And the more I studied, the more I realized that no one had a corner on this. And there were a lot of things that were 
not certain in my own mind and in the theology of the 33,000 plus Protestant denominations that I was trying to tap into. Well, I never considered the Catholic Church as an option. It wasn't even on the radar screen. It was so far out. I'd always been taught that it was the perfect counterfeit of true Christianity. And so it was probably the most dangerous thing. It wasn't even on the radar screen for me. But as I began to see the foundations of my own Protestant tradition tremble and cracks form in the foundation because of these major issues of authority, who speaks for God today? Who interprets the Bible? How do I know what these passages mean when there's conflicting theologians? It wasn't the, the church, the Catholic church became beautiful to me first. It was because I first saw the weaknesses in my Protestant tradition. And only then did I start to look and say, well, does anybody, is there a different position here? And then a friend of mine converted to the Catholic church. We had been best friends for 15 years. And he told me he was going to convert to the Catholic church. And I said to him, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard of in my life. You are way too smart to be a Catholic. <laughs> but, my respect for him and his slow prompting me to read, I went back and started to read the very first writers, the very first commentators on Scripture. And I had always believed that the earliest Christians were basically Protestant in their mentality, a simple, non-Catholic kind of non-sacramental Christianity, the Bible alone, keep it simple, ask Jesus to be your Savior. But the more I read, and how many times have we heard this on your show from converts, the more I read the very first writings of the very first Christians, the very first commentators on Scripture, they were Catholic. And it rattled my whole world. My wife and I felt that we were falling, a free fall. And the more I read, though, the more I realized that I had to intellectually become a Catholic, even though it was the last thing in the world we wanted to do. That's the short story. When you look back, did it cross your mind when you were collecting that wall of commentaries that that, that wall of commentaries in itself is a visual oxymoron to the yes. idea of sola scriptura? Yes, yes. because see, I would have taught even when I taught Bible studies and so on then, that the Bible's easy to understand. It was written for the common man. Well, Martin Luther said, if you get it into the hands of the plow boys and the servant girls, everybody can interpret it for themselves because it's easy to understand, easy to interpret. And yet, why can't the, big, the best theologians today, why are they still arguing about it? Why are there still 20, 30, 40 commentaries a year coming out of, of Protestant presses on, on the book of John? or on the As book well of, as different translations. Absolutely. Every year, it seems, a new right. translation what is so the even right translation? just the translation of the original language right. itself is a right. problem. And so here I am saying how easy the Bible is to understand from this Protestant position, and yet I have a hundred commentaries on John, and I'm trying to understand what it means. And yes, the contradiction did settle in after a time, <laughs> and eventually I became a Catholic. Well, uh, you've been making these journeys to the Middle East, and you're, you're taking on the image of the, the Catholic um, Indiana Jones. Yeah, that's right. In <laughs> fact, my nickname's got Jerusalem Jones. In fact, if you go on my web on the internet and type in JerusalemJones.com, you come to my website. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> and I mean, there you are experiencing what so many of us that love Scripture dream about, yeah. and to walk in the steps of Jesus, in the steps of Abraham and Moses and and the apostles, and to see the the Jericho walls and the Mount Sinai and all those wonderful things. I mean, you've been there and you've experienced yeah, it. It is. Couple questions. One, and you know there are people out there that, that also say that if we ever went over there, there'd be no proof that the Jews were ever in e Egypt. You know, you wonder if any of this stuff has just been made up. So from what you have found, talk to the audience, one, about how does it confirm what you always loved and studied in Scripture okay. from what you've seen. And second of all, is what you're finding a confirmation of your Catholicism? In what ways is it, first of all, confirmation of Judaism and Christianity, okay. but second of all, your Catholicism particularly? Those are good questions. And the first of all is one of the beauties of the Christian faith is that it's historical. It's rooted in verifiable history. Paul and Peter and the apostles did not come up with a wonderful fable. The Bible doesn't start out with once upon a time. This is historical faith. We are tied into real history and space and time. God does not just work in somewhere outer space. He doesn't just work in mythology. 
God works in real human history. And so when we read the Bible and it tells us that God did something or that Jesus walked here or such and so happened, we believe that the Bible is the Word of God and it's inspired and it's true. And so when you go to the Holy Land and when you go to discover this, you expect to find these things that are true. And guess what? You do. Now, every fact of the Bible isn't proven by archaeology because much has been destroyed over there. There has been wars. There have been uh, changes of country yeah. and desert uh, sandstorms and everything. You know, oh, yeah. and, and, for example, if you put this Bible out into the desert in a while, it would just, uh, you know, decay. And, and so the, the, the original manuscripts and so on, there's, there's a lot that we're not going to ever find. But what we do find confirms the scriptures. We, you know, I've just, five weeks, six weeks, we were over in Israel, Jordan, and Egypt, and down in the Sinai. And to read, to go into these various holy sites and to read these passages and to see that the things that the Bible tells us, mm -hmm. even about the age, the time of Moses, the time of Abraham, that it, it just shows when you see these things that it's true. The Bible is reflecting the real cultures of the time. And the, the people and the places are still named after the mm -hmm. uh, characters of the Bible. So does it confirm our Christian faith? Absolutely it does, because our faith is a historical faith. Paul doesn't say that we we have these things by wishful thinking. He says that there are people who saw the resurrection. If the resurrection didn't happen, if this is not historical religion, then eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Hmm. But if it is true, then we better give our life to it. And th there's some people have said that by seeing the Holy Land, it's the, four, the fifth gospel. Hmm. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the fifth gospel is the Holy Land because yeah. it then again tells the story in a whole new way, and it's a beautiful way, and it confirms the scripture. Now, your second question is, how does it affect my Catholicism, or does it confirm my Catholicism? And I have to say, more profoundly than I would have believed, because... As a Protestant, I probably would have gone over and, and studied these areas as a tourist or as a scholar or something of that nature. Now, we still do that, but having the Catholic theology and understanding sacramental things, when we go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where Jesus was crucified on Calvary and then down on the lower level where the tomb is, where he was buried, to stand there, I have very seldom been in that church without tears in my eyes. Mm -hmm because of the sacramental nature. Remember when Moses was at the burning bush and he, he had to take his shoes off, his sandals off because it was holy ground? Catholics have that sense of the sacramental, the sacredness. And when you go to these holy sites as a Catholic, it's very palpable. You can feel that holiness about those sites. And also what I find there is that we're studying, back there you're studying the Old Testament, which is Judaism. And you're studying the New Testament, which is also the Jewish people. Jesus was a Jew. Mary, Peter, Paul, they were Jewish. Mm -hmm. And when I go back and I study the Old Testament and the first century Christianity, I find out how, how Jewish the Catholic Church is. Mm -hmm. You can't understand the Bible without understanding the Jewish beginnings. And when you study the Jewish beginnings of Christianity in the Old Testament, you find out how the Catholic Church is the reflection of that. For example, we were just up on Mount Sinai. One o'clock in the morning, we rode camels up there. I had to rent 12 camels to get to the top. And when we got to the top, we read the passage, Exodus 18, 19, 20, about the giving of the law. When Moses came down from Sinai, he had three things. He had the written law inscribed on the stone. He also had an oral Torah, an oral law or tradition that he brought down with him, and he also had a teaching authority. And it said then he sat and he judged the people. Well, here we have a three-legged stool of authority, written, oral, and a teaching authority or magisterium. Now, what does that remind you of today? It doesn't remind me of my Protestant tradition where I had the Bible alone, only the written Word of God. What I discovered in the Catholic Church and by studying this, the Catholic Church is the heir or the successor of the Jews. What was the chair of Moses is now the chair of Peter. The Old Testament has now been fulfilled and fleshed out in the whole canon of Scripture, the Old and New Testament now. It doesn't do away with the Old. It's a fulfillment and a revealing of what's in the Old. And the oral law that Moses came down from Mount Sinai with is the same thing we have in the tradition of the church, the apostolic tradition. We have the same three-legged stool. Mm -hmm. So the more I study in the Holy Land and the, t and the life of the Jews and the Old Testament and the early church, the more I'm convinced that the Catholic Church is the one that has the claim to be the heirs of the apostles. You've just, uh, maybe we'll get some questions on that because that's, that's fascinating, uh, Steve, thanks. Let's, um, you have a book that's just come out, hot off the I'm press. I'm very excited about it. 
um, St. John's Gospel, Ignatius Press, a Bible study guide and commentary for individuals and groups. It's great. A lot of people don't think Catholics read the Bible. I mean, hey, uh, it's our Bible, you know, I mean, it's our it book. Is. But uh, this is a wonderful presentation uh, to help us through this, our personal study of St. John. Talk a bit about uh, your own study of Scripture. You always loved it before. I always loved it. Always loved it. Walls and walls of commentaries. Even in high school, my, my wife met me the first time in the hall, the first time she met me. I had a stack of books in my arms walking through the high school, but they weren't on math and algebra and all the things I was supposed to be studying. <laughs> Shame on me. They were Greek lexicons, commentaries on Scripture, all these things, and I was teaching myself Greek so that I could read the, understand the Bible in the original languages, and I had, this is what I did in high school in my free time, and my, that's when my wife first met me. She said, I'm going to marry that man someday. <laughs> She told me later. But I loved the Bible, even from the age of 17. Mm. I, it, was a, it was a gift of the Holy Spirit, and it was a gift of my parents. I have to say both. And so studying the Bible has always been one of my favorite things to do. But when you became a Catholic, of course, then you left all that behind, right? Oh, yes. No. no. You know, and, uh, you know I mean, better than that. Mike. I know. <laughs> but let's talk about, you know, in the eight years you've been a Catholic, continuing your scripture studies. In what way, for example, is the Gospel of John solidified and can further convince you in your decision to become Catholic? I'd have to use an example of something like the bud of a flower. When I was an evangelical Protestant, I loved the flower, but it was the bud. Hmm. And it was beautiful, and I could look at it from all different angles and study it, and it was wonderful. But by becoming a Catholic and understanding and looking at the Scriptures through the lens of the Catholic Church and the tradition and the teachings of the fathers and the doctors of the Church, and the, hmm. all of a sudden, that that bud opened up in front of my eyes. So what was beautiful before now is much more beautiful. And it's now become f much more full of life. It's another beauty of it is, is I don't have to create my own theology like I did before. I didn't have to critique a hundred different authors and try and come up with my own yeah. solidified idea of what this passage actually means. I can rest now in the teaching of, a, of an authoritative church and the doctors and the fathers of the church were the most wonderful expositors of scriptures. It's amazing to go back and read what they wrote about scripture, Augustine and Chrysostom and these guys. This is fantastic. So the Bible to me now is like a flower that has bloomed in front of me and it is much richer and fuller and more beautiful now. And there are no more passages that don't make sense. I used to call them blip verses. Verses that as an evangelical just did not fit my theology. If you say that baptism does nothing, it's only symbolic, and you come across 1 Peter 3.21 where it says baptism now saves you, how do you deal with yep. that? See, that was a blip verse that I basically had to set on my shelf because it didn't fit my theology. But now as a Catholic, as I read the Bible, the Catholic Church has done such a beautiful job of keep being faithful to every passage without conflicting each other or nullifying one verse in order to hold to another. And now the beauty is, is that the whole Bible makes sense and it fits together like a wonderful hand in a glove. One of my blip verses was, I used to teach eternal security, but there was always that passage in Hebrews 6 that says it's impossible to bring someone back once they've tasted of the realities of Christ and committed apostasy. Oh man, what do you do with that? <laughs> so you, you read, you jump over it real quick. But, you know, one of the problems that I have encountered with some converts to the church who loved the scriptures and came from the perspective of reading the Bible as the sole source of truth to find out what's true, that once they became Catholic and they had the catechism teaching the church, it's like all the wind was out of their sails for why they study scripture. You see what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. You know, they used to go and they said, okay, let's find out the truth about baptism. So look up every verse in, on baptism and now I know what baptism means. Well, when the t church teaches you the truth about baptism, then some would say, well, why do I need the Bible anymore? Yeah. Well, how do you answer that? Well, the, the Bible is the Word of God, and it's exciting, and it's living, and it's throbbing all the time. Whether you know what baptism means or not, whether you've read the catechism and understand the teaching on baptism and holiness and the sacraments or whatever, that's all fine and good, and we need to do that. But it never takes away from the need to study the Word of God because the Catechism never claims to be inspired. It's authoritative teaching. But the Word of God in Scripture is inspired and it's living and it's like a two-edged sword. And reading the Bible is like reading a living document. It's still throbbing with life and it still changes our life. And we need to still do that. We need to study this. Do I have one minute to explain? Sure. Okay. And then we'll take our first call. Okay. okay. 
the way I view the scriptures is, as an evangelical, I used to read it, and um, you can see from over history, people who have studied it on their own without an authoritative church and without the protection of this kind of a, a overarching authority. I use the example of a playground where you see children out playing in the playground and on one side is a pi uh, vipers and on the other side is a cliff and on the other side is other dangers. And you watch the children one at a time fall yeah. off the cliff and, it's, and it's, you're watching in terror as you do it. The, studying the Bible is like that playground. And if we go out there and there's no fences and there's no supervision and there's no uh, instruction for us, just think of how many bodies are strewn along the highway of Scripture study over the last two millennia. But yet, if you take that same playground with those same children, playing with the Scriptures like you and I should, we should just delve in and play and have fun with the Bible because it's rich. Ask the Holy Spirit to help us understand it. Teach me what this, apply this passage to me. But if we do that with the protection of the fence around it, which is the tradition of the church, the teaching of the church, and the supervision in a sense, which is like the, the magisterium and the fathers of the churches, mm -hmm. and we can go out in that playground and we can play with great abandon and love the Bible and the Holy Spirit can apply it to our life and help us to become holy and more like Jesus, but we have the protection of the church. Mm -hmm. And so, yes... We need to read the Catechism. We need to study the Bible in light of the Catechism, but don't cover, don't close the Bible. Keep that open. I was just reading just this last week about a particular non-Catholic Christian tradition. I'm not going to name it, but the history of this group began when a particular layman studying the Bible discovered, believed that he had discovered the long-lost gospel and that he felt in his heart that God was calling him to start a new church based on this discovery of a long lost gospel. He had a television and a radio program. People started this new denomination. People gathered all over the world in this group. And one of the understandings of this particular group was that you were not to read literature or books by any other Christian groups because you might be misled by the devil. So all these people were following this one man and his son eventually. Yes. When the man died, he had a hand-picked follower to carry on this particular church who opened the idea to all kinds of other ideas and eventually that church just split and split and split yeah. in all kinds of other groups. Yeah. Again, you have this self-imposed yeah. fence yeah. that somebody yeah. can can rather uh, can impose around people rather than the uh, the church that Christ established yeah. and so that's what we I just be love being a Catholic about. because of the teaching of the scripture and they're not it, it's not an authoritative kind of a thing there's a yeah. tremendous freedom to study and interpret yeah. the Bible for yourself but there's just certain parameters that we have to watch okay let's take our first caller this is Helen from Massachusetts hello what's your question for us tonight hi it's um an interesting question. I love God's Word, and I love the Lord Jesus with all my heart, and yeah. I've been seeking the truth. I've been in the Protestant denomination for about 25 years, yeah. and I've come up against so many discrepancies regarding the Word of God. And my question is, what is the origin of the Catholic Bible, the manuscripts it was translated from? Um, how does this differ from the manuscripts, perhaps, that were used in the Protestant Bible? And I know about the Apocrypha being different in both, sure. but more or less the translation and the authenticity of it, knowing that it, this is the true inspired Word of God. And Thank you, Helen. Wonderful question. Yeah, well, uh, just a quick history. is uh, The Old Testament was basically written in Hebrew and the New Testament in Greek in the first century. Uh, the New Testament and the Old Testament, obviously, in the years of B.C., before Christ. And there were no Protestant translations, obviously, until the 16th century or so, because uh, there were no Protestants. It was, there was one church. It was a Catholic church. And the church took it upon herself to be the caretaker and a preserver and a translator and, uh, of the scriptures. And over a period of time, um, based on the tradition, in a sense, they decided which books belonged in the New Testament. And it was a 400-year process. I mean, that's as long, yeah. it took as long to decide which 27 books were there and authoritative and collected as it was from the time the pilgrims left England and the Mayflower until today. That's a 400-year period. They did not have a closed, collected canon. Well, the Catholic Church, though, through her bishops, determined which books belonged in there, and then they kept translating it into the language of the people. And Jerome, St. Jerome in Bethlehem, a doctor of the church, 
translated it into Latin. Why Latin? Because that was the language of the, of the empire. Anyone who could read could read Latin. And that was the Bible that Catholics used and still use. And then as the uh, more, tra more uh, different uh, manuscripts came out, there was more of a purifying in a sense, and you've got more, you've got more uh, original writings to work with. Um, and over a period of time, they get closer and closer to what the original was. And then the Protestants started to do their own and make it in the language of the people, but the Catholics have already made the language uh, Bible. And, you know, I was always told that Martin L Luther was the first one to bring the Bible into the language of the people. And I found out <laughs> later that the Catholic Church had provided translations of the Bible in German before Martin Luther was born oh, yeah. and, and passed them out. But then what the real difference, I think, is we're, we're dealing with the same manuscripts, Catholics and Protestants, but nobody is objective. Nobody can be completely objective. We all have a tradition that we, believe, that we follow. And so in Protestants, when they translate the Bible, they will have a bias to translate certain things according to fit into their tradition. And the Catholic Church, obviously, will do, is trying to be faithful to the original manuscripts, but also it is showing the truth the way that, they, that their tradition teaches. So the real difference isn't so much that we have different Bibles is the way that they're translated. Um, for example, the New International Version, um, whenever the word tradition is used in a negative sense, it uses the word tradition. But whenever the Greek word tradition is used in a positive sense, it uses the word teaching. Yeah. In other words... It's the same Greek it's root. It's the same Greek word. Yeah. But you don't, because Catholics talk about tradition as a good thing, in this translation, they'll change the word, the same Greek word, to teaching. So it doesn't kind of smack of Catholicism in a sense. So really it's a matter of uh, biases. I want to throw one quick thing in here with yeah. that, just to add, which was exciting for me to discover, is that when you look at, in the New Testament, when it quotes the Old Testament, if you study the, the wording in the New Testament with the wording in the Old Testament, you'll often wonder that the New Testament author misquoted the Old Testament. There's something wrong here. That the New Testament, Paul, James, John, quoting from the Old Testament, misquoted. There's something wrong here. And what you find is, is that, which you, you, I know you, in telling it quickly, you didn't mention it, but that uh, there was a Greek translation of the Old right. Testament called yeah. the Septuagint, long before Christ, right. made by 70 Greek scholars, and it became the text of preference during the New Testament period. And the re reason we know that is that when we look at the Greek of those quotes in the New Testament from the Old, it's word for word yep. with the Greek Old Testament. Yep. Now, all of that said, the reason that's important is the Greek Septuagint, the Old Testament, had all the books. The ones that were outside of the Bible I had as a Protestant. That's right. They, they were all, which right. meant that when Paul says in, in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God, he could have only been referring to the Old Testament, and he would have been referring to the Greek Old Testament, right. which had all the books. Because that's the one he quoted from. Yeah. And it yeah. had all those books. So when he said that, he's referring to all the books that are in the, ca the Catholic canon. Yeah. That's right. a strong confirmation yep. to all the Old Testament yep. books. Right. which, or including the books that our non-Catholic brothers and sisters call apocryphal. You know, I've learned to trust the Catholic Church on decisions yeah. like this. I spent a long time trying to fight her and thinking I was smarter than her. But, uh, you know, over a period of time, as an evangelical, when I tried to argue with the Catholic Church, I was trying to protect myself from becoming a Catholic. But over a period of time, I realized that the Catholic Church was much smarter than I was. That's a good note to end on. <laughs> Let's take a break. We'll come back just in a moment with some of your, your questions and emails for Steve Ray.
Welcome back to The Journey Home. My guest Stephen Ray has talked about his journey and we've been dealing with some issues of scripture. Why don't we jump in immediately with uh, another email. This comes from Laura in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Dear Marcus and uh, Steve, there has been a recent news story on the finding of an ossuary with the Aramaic inscription, James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. Some believe this might be archaeological evidence for the existence of Jesus. I had always been told that Aramaic did not have a word for brother. Can you clarify this story? I had another well, question to go along with that. Why don't you answer that one first? Okay, well, I, I think that it's what she means there is that Aramaic doesn't have a word for cousin. Um, it does have a word for bro your brother, the, the Hebrew and Aramaic do. Um, so I, th the situation is here is, is this a legitimate archaeological find? A, lot's, uh, a lot is still out and to be told, you know. I think it probably is. And is this referring to Jesus and Joseph and the James that we know in the Bible? We don't know that either. There's going to be a lot of research, and I don't know if anyone will ever prove, you know, statistically that it is. Or, but if it probably is. Yeah. And so um, it doesn't in any way... Uh, I think, hinder or uh, debunk the Catholic teaching of the perpetual virginity of Mary. It doesn't say here that uh, J uh, right. James was the son of Mary. It's the son of Joseph. And even in the early church, I think Jerome held this in his letter to Helve against Helvetius, um, that, that uh, Joseph may have had a children by a prior marriage, and he was a widower, and he, uh, an older man maybe, and he married uh, Mary. And took her as his wife because he could be almost kind of a fatherly protective figure for her. So uh, it doesn't in any way uh, damage the Catholic position at all. And a lot, I think, is still you were, out. You were even saying in the issue of co cousin and brother, you were just yeah. encountered at yourself even right. when you're in the Middle East? When we're in the Middle East, it's, uh, you know, they, uh, there's not the clear distinction of uh, nucleus families like we have father, mother, and children, and then we build walls around uh, ourselves, you know, and then there's one little family here, one little... F in the Middle East, you're, it's bigger families. I mean, in Jordan, there's still tribes. We, we, I was, my wife and I were godparents for a little girl named Leah in Jordan when we were there, and she was baptized in the Jordan River, and he's part of a tribe that has 15,000 members, and they have a chief. And everybody... At this baptism, there were a hundred people. All of them were brothers. They're all brothers. But you know, I, this you mom couldn't have all these kids. Oh, this is my cousin. This is my brother here. Like, they're very uh, bigger view of a family, yeah. and even the scriptures refer to James as the brother of our Lord. And uh, you'd think that in the first centuries when the Catholic Church said that Mary did not have any other sons, uh, that they would have said, well, wait a minute, here's James, a brother of the Lord, mm -hmm. you know, as uh, proof. But the church always understood that Mary was, uh, had one son, and uh, there were no other sons. Something else that struck me when I first heard about this story was that there, uh, there were so many people that were, uh, you know, amazed by this finding and they see it as this proof of the reality of Jesus as if we don't have other things from yeah, the time right. of Jesus. Right. I know when I was brought up a Protestant and went to Protestant seminary, we always said, ain't it great we don't have any you know, uh, artifacts from the time of Jesus. But when the reality is, the only reason that, we would dis that they disclaim that is because they disclaim everything the Catholic Church claims yeah. we have from that yeah. time, for example. Yep. There's another good example, too, that there was a, a time when Pontius Pilate was considered to be a fictitious figure, that he was just the fall guy for the crucifixion. Uh, but, you know, in the 60s, in Caesarea, and I've been fortunate enough to see this, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be in our Jesus video when it comes out this spring, um, in, the, in, the, in Caesarea was discovered a stone plaque that was now uh, used as a step because once the procurator loses his job or dies, they take down all of his uh, placards and use them for other things. Well, and it's right here said Pontius Pilate of Tiberias. See, well, all of a sudden now there's physical evidence for the fact that Pontius Pilate was not a fictitious person. He was a real historical person. Why should it surprise us? I, I would be expecting to find more and more evidence as we dig and dig more in the Holy Land. We're going to find more and more evidence to verify and confirm this book because this is the Word of God and it doesn't lie to us. Yeah. It's rooted in history. And there's lots of stuff that we date that's back right. to the time of Christ Absolutely. that's all over uh, the, the Middle East if, we, right. if we're open to... Uh, if our doubt doesn't stand in the way of right. what we find. Let's take our next caller, Carolyn from Indiana. What's your call? Your question for us tonight? Where does the Pope or the Catholic Church get the teaching or the idea that the priests and nuns must be single? There's a lot of 
news um, out now uh, with regard to controversy on this subject? Sure. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you. Well, I'll throw out my thoughts and yep, you I'll can add pick a few. up from there. <laughs> okay. um, first of all, we have to understand the difference between a dogma and a discipline. And what, that, what I mean by that is there are some things in the, in the church which are dogmas of the faith, teachings of the faith that are non-changeable. They're revelation the from God, the Trinity, divinity of the divinity of Christ, the redemptive work of Christ on the cross. All of these things are non-negotiable. They are truths that must be held. A discipline, on the other hand, is something that the Catholic Church can impose or remove based on what is good for the church at that time. And that authority is given to the church when Peter was given the keys and what he bound on heaven, well, on earth would be ratified in heaven. That's what it means, ratified. And what he loosed on earth would be ratified in heaven. So the church has been given the authority to make legislative and judicial decisions regarding the faithful. And these are called disciplines. And the thing of celibacy, the issue of celibacy, is not a dogma of the faith. It is a discipline that has been imposed upon the church for well, as long as the church feels it's necessary for the good of the church. Now, we can say sometimes disciplines change, like when you fast on one day, now you don't have to fast, or so on. And people will say, you know, the church can't make up its mind on these disciplines, you know, these things. But, you know, I'm the same. I'm a father. And there's a time where I tell my daughter she can't drive. And then all of a sudden I change my mind when she turns 16 and get a license. I say, now you can drive. Mm -hmm. And she could say, why don't you make up your mind? Can I drive or can't I drive? See, the church has the authority like a parent to decide what is good for the faithful at a certain point in time. There is good scriptural warrant for yeah. celibacy. Paul says, I wish that all men were like I am single so that they can live single-heartedly and devoted to the Lord. A married man has to spend much of his time with his family and doing these things, and he can't give his whole devotion to the people of God, the church. John says that there are going to be those in heaven who have never known a woman who will have a special place before the Lamb. They will follow him. And Jesus says in Matthew 19 that there are some who have the gift to be eunuchs for God, meaning to be celibate and to live for God. There are some, I don't have that gift. But there are some that God has given that gift. Nobody says that you have to be celibate, but if you are going to be a priest and you're going to call to that position, the church says that for this point in history and time, and it may change, we don't know, that the priest needs to be single and celibate so that he can live his life wholly devoted to the bride of Christ, his wife, which is the church, the bride of Christ. Yeah, a couple things let me add. Uh, first of all, it's one thing on the issue of whether it's a required discipline of, discipline of the Latin church, that priests and religious... Right. I mean, That's that, a good point. That, that, you know, the, yeah. But we recognize that the practice of celibacy as a choice of one's vocation, as a part of one's vocation in religious life goes back to the beginning. We have evidence of right. this in the Eastern Orthodox Church. Right. We have it in the, in the Latin Church. It goes all the way back. Whether it was required for all priests at one time or the other, whether right. it could be married priests also, is, is another issue, but the reality is that the tradition of celibacy as a vocation goes all the way back. It does. And we see yeah. that in the early fathers, it's, it's always there. It goes back, in, and what we see in the earliest writings that justified this, and one of the earliest comes from the second or third century, a small synod of bishops in Africa when they're dealing with an issue related to this. I mean, this is a long time ago, and it's very, I mean, this is the earliest of the fathers. They are saying that the reason they recognize this practice of celibacy, or continence, they mm -hmm, called that mm -hmm. at, at, at the time, is because they believed it was an apostolic tradition. That's right. It was tracing it back to the teachings of the apostles. Right. So that's why they believed it. They're following the teaching of the apostles. Right. The other thing I need to talk to, that they're one of the statements in the question, and it was a fine question, but she made the comment, given our problems today, Mm -hmm. given the scandal right. today, and, right. and she makes that connection between there's the scandal and celibacy. And we have to be careful making that connection because it isn't a legitimate connection. It's not as if the reason we have the scandal is because we've imposed a celibacy, because the reality is, the sad reality is, that the problem that we're struggling with in this scandal of our crazy society today is, is just as prevalent in all other areas of life. That's right. Single or married. And I know from uh, 
the world, the, the Protestant world that I came from, that the problem exists there in even a higher percentage, sadly. Yes, and these, and here we're dealing with married clergy, and yet, and I, I, I know of many situations that I can yeah. personally attest to, that married Protestant clergy also have many of the same problems, and I think from what I've understood, even the percentages are higher. Yeah, getting rid of celibacy is not the issue. No. The issue has to do with conversion of heart, has That's to right. do with living according to vows, right. live, you know, understanding. There's a lot of issues right. there. Sure is. And we live in a culture today where we're surrounded by so many voices that are trying to tempt us. I mean, there's it's mm -hmm. all kinds of difficult mm -hmm. lights. But when we look at it, we live in a country where it's 50% end up in divorce. Mm -hmm. that, that doesn't speak very well to marriage being mm -hmm. the answer to these problems. Mm -hmm. right. you know, it's an issue of, of, con of commitment. And, and, and in light of that, we really need to support the priests because these are wonderfully holy yeah. men. And just because there's a bad apple in a bushel somewhere, it should not shed a bad light on all uh, celibacy and priesthood. Um, they're marvelous. Even among Jesus' 12 bishops that he chose, one was a bad guy. Yeah. But in no way did that one Judas priest no way did he in any way discredit Jesus or the mission he was on. Yeah. And when there was a bad one, it was, he was eliminated. A new one was brought on, Matthias. And uh, in no way does a, a bad priest every once in a while give a bad light to the priesthood or celibacy. All right, let's take this next email. Joan in Illinois, dear Marcus and Stephen. Explain where the Catholic Church came to believe that birth control was wrong, other than the two somewhat weak scripture readings I have been shown. How can I help a Baptist become open to life? Uh, there's the, that's a good question. And when did the Catholic Church start teaching that it was? I think that, that there's a misunderstanding there because it has always been taught yeah. that birth control was wrong, that children were a gift from God. And right from the Psalms, you know, the more arrows you have in your quiver, the better off you are. Yeah. Give me sons, you know, is the thing. The more children, the better. They were a gift from God. And the funny thing was is that all Christian groups opposed contraception up until 1930, and I'm not an expert on this, but I've read That's a little right. bit about it, that every Protestant group, Calvin, Luther, all of them were opposed to this contraceptives. It was a great sin and a wicked evil. And it wasn't until the 1930s that in England, I think it was, there were some Protestant denominations that said under certain circumstances we can allow contraceptives. And pretty soon, the 20th century scientific skeptical anti-God kind of mentality crept into the churches. Yeah. And people began to no longer accept what was held for 2,000 years without ever a, a, a break. And now in the 20th century, it began to be accepted. And one of the reasons I'm a Catholic too, I didn't bring up this issue, is because the Catholic, has, the, the Catholic Church has the guts to stand up and say what Jesus wants. And it doesn't matter what the population, what, it doesn't take a popularity vote. It's not a democracy of God. Jesus didn't give us a democracy of God. He gave us a kingdom of God. And the king has told us what he expects. And I love the Catholic Church because she's like a huge oak tree standing out in the field. And you can challenge her and you can go up and kick her and you can try to hurt her all you want and challenge her. But she still stands for the truth and she's not going to change because she speaks for God. And in the groups that I was in, if I didn't like the teaching of contraceptive in one, I could go find somewhere else. And I found Protestant churches that fit what I wanted to believe, what my morals were. And it was like a marketplace. You could go down the street and pick one here, there, whatever fit your personal taste the best. Yeah. And it was in many ways easier to be a Protestant than it is a Catholic because you could kind of find a church that fit your mold. When I became a Catholic, I realized I had to join a church that fit Jesus' mold and I had to, yeah. a church that taught what he taught unwaveringly and that's what I had to obey. You know, actually, that leads me to one of the reasons why I, I believe in celibacy of the clergy because I know how hard it is when I was a married clergyman with a, a wife and family and all those responsibilities, it becomes very difficult to stand in front of a congregation and tell them to live a certain way when they don't want to live that way. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of pressure and the risks that mm -hmm. are there because of your job, because mm -hmm. of the pressures of that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I wonder if that's part of the reason why all these other denominations eventually folded under the pressure of our growing cultural mm -hmm. voices when to me, celibacy of the clergy, one of the beauties of that is that they have the freedom to risk yeah. being true. Yep. And when you go into dangerous areas where it's war-torn, when many of the clergy leave and you find out who are the few clergy that remain, it's the celibate priests and the sisters. 
Yeah. Because they're not tied to a family. They're willing to lay down their lives and stay in these dangerous situations. And I'm not saying Protestants don't at times too, but if you have a family and you're in a dangerous war situation in a country, your first thing is to get out and save your family. But you go into these terrible areas where there's... Well, you have a responsibility as a husband and yeah. a father to your Absolutely. children. But right. when you are celibate, you are completely sold to Jesus. That's right. You are not being a, uh, an unfaithful husband, unfaithful right. father. You are being faithful to your spouse, the church. Which is the church. All right. Let's, uh, I'll tell you, let's take another caller, if we would. What's your question for us tonight? Hello? Uh, Carolyn from Nebraska. Hello. What's your question for us tonight? Yeah. Um, I wondered if uh, Ray, Mr. Ray, by chance, had uh, visited the sites of the New Mysteries of the Rosary that the Holy Father claimed. Oh, yes, yes, yes. You see, that his, would have been the... One the, was the baptism. The baptism. I was up to my hips in the Jordan River <laughs> in Bethany beyond the Jordan. And it's actually the place where Jesus was really baptized uh, is right at the northern tip of the Dead Sea, and it's on the Jordan side. And it says that John was on the other side of the Jordan in Bethany there, and Jesus came out and... He was baptized. In fact, that's the same place where Moses ordained Joshua and he crossed over the Jordan mm -hmm. there. Elijah gave Elisha the mantle and he crossed over. And that's the place where John the Baptist baptized Jesus and he crossed over. Yeah, and so. one of each of those three groups was on the Mount of Transfiguration. So, Elijah, Moses, and Jesus. So there's the Transfiguration is right. the, the fourth And new. the fourth one there, we were just up there two weeks ago. Well, that was the fourth, Transfiguration, right? Right. What about Baptism the... Baptism uh, was the first one. Second is right. the wedding. The wedding of Cana, yes. In, uh, in my video called Mary, Mother of God, I spend about ten minutes there and I explain how Mary is a, is a mediator and an intercessor for us and the whole implications of water and wine. So we're there in Cana. Cana the kingdom the, the is baptism, the third one. The kingdom, yes. And, and that could be a lot of places Well, let's, let's put it at the Mount of Beatitudes because there he's preaching the yeah. kingdom and, it's, and he's actually showing himself to be the new Moses because Moses went up on a mountain and sat down and taught the people. Well, Jesus goes up on a mountain and he sits and he reinterprets the law. He's the new Moses. So he's preaching the kingdom there all through Galilee, but in special we could say at the Mount of Beatitudes and we were just filming there two weeks ago. Okay. And, and you've then been I the think Transfiguration. You've the, been there. Right, several times. Now the Eucharist is... And then the fifth one is the Cenacle, which is the traditional upper room in... Uh, it's right above the tomb of now, David. Why do we believe that that room is the place? Well, um, a lot of times we have to trust the earliest Christians. And, for example, when Jesus was crucified and buried and rose again, that site was very special to them. And they would come there to pray, and they would build a little altar there, and they'd remember it. And so the tradition, we, it's, it doesn't just mean it's, it's a light thing. The tradition of the early church about these sites is very strong evidence because they remembered where these sites were. Uh, the cynical, or the upper room, was uh, the place where many things took place there. I mean, it's rich because there is where the, the, uh, the Eucharist was... Um, instituted the Last Supper. It was there that the priesthood was established. Later, Jesus breathed on them the Holy Spirit and, and gave, established confession. So this is a marvelous room. So yeah, all five of those we were Exciting actually at. Do, and if yeah. you watch our videos, you'll see all of those places and all the Catholic implications of them. Excellent. Let's grab one more email. Uh, comes from Lewis in Ohio. I have enjoyed your program. The Catholic Church, as you say, truly is a historic church. But I'm wondering what we could say to someone who com comments that Islam is also historic. What specific difference could we make between the two faiths regarding truth and historicity? Okay. Being historical doesn't make it true and doesn't make it a true religion. For example, uh, many things can be true and historically accurate, but it doesn't make them eternally true. The difference is... is there that may have been a Confucius. There may have been a Buddha. You right. know, I mean, that's historical. Exactly. Now... The difference with these two is the resurrection of Christ, I think. If you want to really boil it down to one issue. And in Islam, they deny the fact that Christ was crucified. They say that he would not. No way, if he was such a great prophet, and uh, could he have been crucified. But the, but the church has always taught. And Paul, the beauty of this in the, in the New Testament, in 1 uh -huh. Corinthians 15, Paul, writing several decades later, says that there were 500 brethren who saw him raised from the dead, saw him alive after his death. And most of them are still alive. And so what I'm teaching you here about Jesus, the Son of God, both man and God, suffered on a cross and died and rose again. It's like one of our friends. If somebody dies and you put him in a coffin and put him in the ground and cover him, and three days later they're in your room talking to you and you go out and look and the ground is dug up and the coffin's open. And Paul has the audacity to say, 
there are 500 brethren who saw that happen. This is real history. Now, the Muslims deny that that happened. They deny that Jesus was God. He was just a prophet. So even though many aspects of their history and so on is historical, yet they deny the essential truths of what the Catholic Church teaches. All right, because it all hinges on our belief in the resurrection. Absolutely. From the very beginning, he has risen, has been right. the call of the foundation right. for our faith. And if that isn't true, then everything else crumbles. In the book, The Brothers Karamazov, it says if there is no immortality, if the resurrection is not true, he echoes what Paul says. Then eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Everything is allowed because there is no judgment. All right, Steve, you've been a Catholic for eight years. You've walked in the footsteps of Moses and Abraham and Jesus. How has your Catholic journey, talk to us again about how that has, has it brought you closer to Jesus? I would say, I'm going to say objectively and subjectively. So I'm going to answer it on two lines. Objectively, it has brought me closer to Jesus because I've understood Jesus in the fullness of the faith, the fullness of the Catholic teaching, the teaching of the apostles, the doctors of the church, the whole beautiful history of the church. So in understanding it that way, um, and, and having now the opportunity to study the Bible and learn about Jesus from what we call what I called earlier the fifth gospel, the Holy Land. Being able to go there and actually see these sites, it has drawn me closer to the to the Jesus that's in heaven now, but the historical Jesus on the earth too. I mean, just the whole beauty of the Catholic teaching of Christ and who He was. Subjectively, I'd have to say that my love of Jesus now is more than it ever has been, and. Even though I was taught to love Jesus, the more you know him, the more you love him. And the Catholic Church has taught me more about him and how to love him more. So because of the teachings of the church, I've grown to love him even more. And I'd also say, and I think you could probably agree with this as a convert yourself, that many of my friends who are converts, because of the sacraments, because of this newly found deeper love of Jesus and the church, and Jesus in his church and the sacraments, there's more of a victory over temptation and sin. There's more of an, a desire to be holy and a victory in that area. I'm not saying I'm holy. I'm just saying that I sense a move in that direction. And my wife can attest to that, and nobody's a better judge of that than your spouse. But the more you get close to Jesus, the more we're supposed to be like him. We're supposed to take on the divine nature. We're supposed to become holy like he is holy. And through the church and through this newfound faith and the sacraments, I can see and feel that taking place in my life. More than I ever could have as a Protestant. More victory over sin than I've ever had as a Protestant. And it's a wonderful, beautiful thing. I just love being a Catholic. Steve, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank Mike. you for joining it's, us. It's always home. great to be here. Encourage the uh, audience to uh, look up your videos. You got one of Peter and Mary already produced, and yep. you're working on the third of the series of ten. Yep. You also have a brand new book, St. John's Gospel by Ignatius Press. So I encourage. You. But also your other books, you know, Crossing the Tiber and then Upon This Rock. Yep. Crossing the Tiber is my conversion story, and Upon This Rock is an explanation and defense of the papacy from their Bible and the early church. All right. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, couple, next couple weeks, uh, I want to tell you something uh, very exciting that I'm going to be, wish, wish I could take you all with me, but uh, the next couple weeks, uh, I have the great privilege of going to England and we'll be there filming, I think, eight episodes of The Journey Home in England of English converts. I also have the great privilege of speaking in Westminster Cathedral about my own conversion to the church. However, next Monday night will be a taped program in which I interviewed Lord David Alton, a cradle Catholic. Our theme was the three C's of compromise, conscience, and conversion. But then during that next week, when I'm doing the eight taped programs in England, you can actually be a part of that. If you go to the website, EWTN.com, go to the Journey Home section, You'll find out more about my trip to England, about which guests I'll be interviewing. Our entire itinerary is on that website, and you'll also have a chance to find out about the guests and what we might be talking about. And you can send your emails to us that we can use when we're making those um, programs in England. So send them to us by November 14th to journeyhome at EWTN.com. And we'll be able to use them during the week of, let's see, what is that, about the 18th through the 22nd is when I'll be in England filming those programs. Uh, the week before that, my wife is going to be with us. We're going to take a little bit of private time and go up to Scotland. Our hope is to visit some of the ancient Catholic sites 
in Scotland. So pray for us while we're gone, enjoying. You know, for us converts, it's great to go back and see those ancient sites of our church. And so I'll look forward to being with you when I get back. And God bless you. It's always a pleasure to be with you. See you then. Thank you.